This week, join me as I go in search of one of the most enigmatic women in all of history, the Queen of Sheba. The Bible says she appeared from the desert leading a caravan of riches to the court of King Solomon in Jerusalem. Many cultures claim her as their own, but what's the truth behind the stories? To find out, I'll explore ruined temples in Ethiopia, follow ancient caravan routes through biblical lands, and head into the dangerous tribal no-man's land of modern Yemen. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. Exotic romance surrounds the legend of the Queen of Sheba. In folk tales and scripture, she's described as beautiful and captivating, sophisticated and powerful, and very, very wealthy. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein. My quest is to determine if the Queen of Sheba really existed, and if so, where she came from. My first stop is the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. The library here has one of the greatest collections of religious texts in the United States. Most of what's known about the Queen of Sheba comes from just a few short passages in the Bible, and I'm hoping that one of the scholars here can help me flesh out her story. According to 1 Kings, the queen journeyed to Jerusalem at the head of a long caravan of gold, precious stones, and spices, which she presented as gifts to King Solomon. But what the Bible doesn't say is where the land of Sheba actually was. Dr. Doug Gropp is an expert in Middle Eastern texts, and I've asked him to help me decipher other passages that may offer some interesting clues. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 20, the Lord says, what is frankincense to me, which comes from Sheba? Doug tells me that the spice the queen brought to King Solomon was frankincense, an aromatic resin that was one of the most prized goods of the ancient world, more precious than even silver or gold. What makes this clue so useful is that frankincense comes from a very limited geographic area. This means I should be able to trace the trade routes back to the Queen's homeland fairly easily, or so I hope. In the ancient world, it came from South Arabian area and on the other side of the Red Sea and Horn of Africa. And that's it? That's pretty much it. So Sheba right. could be that region. Right. Somewhere, okay. Somewhere in that region. Is there any place else in the Bible where we can learn about Sheba? Well, there's a few other places uh, that mention Sheba, but there's also a related term, a term that most scholars think is related that has just a different S sound, uh, Seba. And Doug explains that Sheba sometimes Sheba appears with a slightly different Christ. spelling and pronunciation. He shows me a passage from the Old Testament book of Isaiah that speaks of a land called Seba, and more importantly, gives a pretty precise clue about where it may have been. Okay, so Seba is a region either south of Sudan or in that, in that yeah. area, the Horn of Africa yeah. area, right. which again is the Ethiopia right. area. Right. Then we have one more passage Another passage right from Isaiah describes the people I'm looking for and even gives them a name. And the Sabaeans, who are described as unshamida, men of stature, huh. tall, tall men, well, tall people. Are, Ethiopians are pretty tall. Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. I have a picture here of Solomon and Sheba's meeting. Doug uh, tells me Ethiopian. that the Ethiopian story of the Queen of Sheba is uh, one of the most elaborate, this, this and that it plays an important role in the country's history. So Ethiopia definitely has a very historical and even tangible connection with the Queen of Sheba. Yeah, it's absolutely central to their whole national consciousness. So the Queen of Sheba may have been from Ethiopia, or she may have been from South Arabia. But based on what I just heard, sounds like Ethiopia has a slight advantage. So it looks like I'm going to Africa. I hop an Ethiopian Airlines flight across the Atlantic to the Horn of Africa. I've been to Ethiopia before, looking for the Ark of the Covenant, and I'm really excited to be back.
I start my search for evidence of the queen in the northern highlands of the country, in a sleepy village with a very promising local nickname. This is the town of Lalibela. It's also called the New Jerusalem, and it's considered by many to be the holiest place in Ethiopia. But is there a connection between this Jerusalem and the Jerusalem visited by the Queen of Sheba? Let's go find out. At first glance, the town doesn't bear much resemblance to Solomon's capital. But there's an elaborate complex of churches here that give the place its holy status and famous nickname. To help me learn the lay of the land, I'm meeting up with Asnaki Hubete of Addis Ababa University. Okay, so I've heard that this place is called the New Jerusalem. Yes, you see, in Ethiopian tradition, it is said to have been that King Laliwela, in order to minimize the journey of Ethiopians to Jerusalem, he was said to have Asnaki been explains that Lalibela is a pilgrimage site modeled on Holy Jerusalem, the same city where King Solomon first impressed the Queen of Sheba with his wisdom. Could this place be part of that legacy? As we come upon the first of the churches, it becomes clear just how inspired Lalibela was. The site is made up of 11 churches, all carved seamlessly from the mountain bedrock, complete with windows and doors. Over the centuries, hundreds of thousands of souls have come to pray here. Even now, it's a thriving center of faith. Everywhere we go, we pass monks and nuns who are immersed in prayer oblivious to our presence. As we pass through one of the dozens of tunnels and passageways on our way to the most sacred of the churches, Asnake fills in the details of the Ethiopian version of the Queen of Sheba legend. Ethiopians believe that from northern Ethiopia, Queen of Sheba, she went to Jerusalem to visit King Solomon. The story that Asnake tells me begins the same way as the biblical tale I heard in Washington. The queen, at the head of a caravan of jewels and incense, journeys to Jerusalem to pay her respects to Solomon. Once in Jerusalem, though, the Ethiopian version takes a very different turn. King Solomon went to sleep with her because of her beauty and her fame, but she refused. According to the legend, the queen resisted Solomon's efforts to seduce her. He promised to leave her be so long as she agreed not to take anything belonging to him. He then set a trap. Solomon served the queen a lavish feast of spicy, salty food, but offered her no water to drink. Forbidden from asking him for anything, she went to bed with her thirst unquenched. Solomon's trap was set. In the dead of night, the queen awoke, desperately thirsty. She searched the palace for water, but the only pitcher had been placed next to the king's bed. The queen had broken her promise, and Solomon felt entitled to break his. According to the legend, the queen bore Solomon a son as a result of that night. Named Menelik I, he founded the Solomonic dynasty in Ethiopia, a dynasty that lasted 3,000 years and ended only with the death of the Emperor Haile Selassie in 1975. Drawing such a connection is a critical part of Ethiopian history and identity. By tracing their descent to Solomon through the Queen of Sheba, the Ethiopians thus become children of Israel and among God's chosen people. The spiritual importance of this new Jerusalem is even more apparent once we reach our destination, the most dramatic church in all of Lalibela. Carved into the shape of a cross, Bet Georgos, or the House of St. George, was the last of the churches to be constructed. The elegant workmanship and fine detail speak to the extra care that was taken in carving it. As we descend through the winding trench towards the entrance, I can't get over how incredible this place is. What's amazing is that a lot of the stone that they had to remove to make those temples, had to go out these narrow corridors. Look at how narrow that is.
Once we're inside, it's clear that other visitors here have been even more affected by the magic of this place. Some of the monks spend years living like hermits in holes carved in the wall, to be as close as possible to the church and to God. Some of them would never leave the church and pray all the time here throughout their life. The whole lifetime? Yes. Living and praying? Wow. And some of them never leave this holy place. So people really did everything they could to be close to this place. Yes, yes. And this is one example. For instance, these are skeletons of people who were believed to have come from Jerusalem, Jewish people. Asnaki shows me the skeletons of pilgrims that the local folklore says came all the way from Jerusalem to pray here at Lalibela. Wow, it's a little bit creepy, huh? Yeah. Their piety was so great that they were left here in death to continue their devotion. Yes. They came here to pray. Yeah. And then they spent their whole lives here. After they came here, they decided to remain here throughout their life. And they died. It's clear that Jerusalem and the Queen have a profound spiritual influence here. But what does this tell me about where to find her? This is a very nice question. Snaki says that Lalibela was completed only 700 years ago. Scholars believe the Queen of Sheba would have ruled in the 10th century BC, nearly 3,000 years ago. So I clearly need to go further back in time to find a tangible connection to the Queen. But Asnaki tells me there is a civilization in Ethiopia that could date back far enough. I just have to travel a bit farther north to find it. Could this be the Sabean Kingdom that Doug told me about back in Washington? I've come to the Horn of Africa searching for the Queen of Sheba and learned that one of the gifts she brought to Solomon was frankincense, which comes from only a few places around the Red Sea. In Ethiopia, I visited a place called the New Jerusalem, where I learned how important the Queen is to Ethiopian national identity. Now I'm following a lead that's brought me into Tigray province, the heart of frankincense country. I've hooked up with my old friend Miss Ghana Gananu to learn more about this precious commodity. So frankincense has been used in Ethiopia for thousands of years. This is from thousand and thousand years ago. The land of frankincense. The Bible says the queen brought Solomon quantities of incense that would never be equal. Learning the history of frankincense in Ethiopia could shed light on whether the queen might have started her journey here. So frankincense is used throughout Ethiopia throughout all types of religious ceremonies. All type of religious. When we have the church, mass, the service, it should not be without incense. No incense, no service, no incense, no life. And now we're going to go see how it's actually Now done. it is the same way of the doing from all tradition until now. So the process hasn't changed too much? Not too much. Everything is doing by hand. We've come to the town of Shire, where frankincense is still processed in the traditional way for sale throughout Africa and the Middle East. Working in this building inside. As soon as we walk in, I can see why he said things haven't changed much. This is how they are preparing for market, for selling. Everyone here is working on frankincense. When they come Here in Tigray money. province, frankincense is a major part of the local economy, just as it's been for millennia. Production involves every member of the community. So the, so the mothers work here, the fathers are out there collecting this. They're collecting in And the, the kids forestry. don't really have any place to go, so they come here and help they their mothers. They come here and help the families, the elders, okay. the parents. Why don't you show me what's happening right here? She is cutting and you know, separating uh, the best quality inside. Frankincense is harvested as a resin that oozes from cuts made into the Boswellia tree. The frankincense is actually in the bark. The process isn't actually that the different from tapping maple trees to make syrup. Only with frankincense, the resin is allowed to harden on the trees. The resin-encrusted bark is then sliced off and brought here, where these women separate the hardened incense from the wood. That's not so good. We not want so good. Ch sharp round. Okay. I decide to give it a try. She's happy. She's like, hey, she's helping me. Or she's like, hey, she's messing up all my hard work. We'll find out soon. Is that a good piece? No? Ah, okay. See that? A little speck there? That's got to come off. I want to make it as, as clean, as clean a resin as possible, right? Clean resin? Yes. Clean resin. She's got to have a really good eye for that, you know? 
What happens next? Okay, I'll show you now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Now I'm second Thank you. Ah. So this is the second phase. This is the second phase because choppy. The other two. After so she, now she's separating, you know? Yeah, but she's basically winnowing these pieces of bark, small bits of bark. Yeah. At each stage of processing, the incense is refined until it's ready for market. The highest grades are exported throughout Africa, the Middle East, and beyond, continuing a trade that began thousands of years ago. So this is the product of all their hard work. Yep. Wow. So if the Queen of Sheba went to Solomon with this, that was an offering. Of course, there is nothing a gift more than this, you see? This is worthy of a king. This is a wonderful present. It is a more than gold. Wow. If frankincense has been such an integral part of the economy and culture here for so long, perhaps Tigray province could have been the land of Sheba. We head on to the tiny village of Yeha, just a couple of hours away to check out a temple. I've been told it dates back to the beginnings of civilization in Ethiopia. Ms. Ghana tells me that Yeha was the center of the first state to arise in Ethiopia between 2,500 and 3,000 years ago. This puts it around the right time for the Queen of Sheba. Could there be any relationship between this place and the mysterious Sabaean civilization? The temple is now little more than a shell, but with its high, well-built walls, it must have been quite a sight in its day, perhaps even suitable for a legendary queen. The complex has since been converted into a Christian church, but the shrine's pagan past is apparent everywhere. Elements from the original temple, like these antelope heads built into the church wall, are still revered. Inside, the monks show me their most prized artifacts, inscriptions removed from the temple. Unfortunately, no one here can read them. In fact, the language they're written in doesn't even come from Ethiopia. What the monks can tell me, though, is that the language they're written in is Sabaean, and that it comes from South Arabia. This is exciting information. Doug Grop told me that the queen might have come from either the Horn of Africa or South Arabia. The evidence here at Yeha indicates that her people may have immigrated to Ethiopia from Arabia, which means I'm hot on the trail. I traced the frankincense trail to the Horn of Africa in search of the Queen of Sheba. I learned how the incense is processed, and I explored the ruins of the first Ethiopian state. Now, despite the warnings of the U.S. State Department, I'm heading 100 miles east across the Red Sea to the South Arabian country of Yemen to track the queen and her civilization. My first stop is Sana'a, the ancient capital of Yemen. So, I've come from Ethiopia, where I've learned that the Sabayan culture has roots here in Yemen. Of course, yes. What is the relationship? Dr. Hussein Al-Amri is a professor at Sana'a University. The Yemen in that time was a center of uh, merchants, and Sana'a, the capital especially, was one of the oldest souk of Arabs. Really? So this city is one of the oldest markets? Yes, the there were. Hussein believes that the queen civilization was based here in Yemen and was built on commerce. He explains that the Yeha temple I saw in Ethiopia was actually a Sabaean colony, established when they extended their trade networks into the Horn of Africa. So people have been meeting here for thousands of years? Yes, of course, yes. Buying, selling, yeah. watching, spending their time. It's a beautiful city. So tell me about the Sabaean civilization lay at the crossroads of trade in antiquity, controlling the movement of goods between section, east huh? and west. Yeah, this is the spice Spices from India, gold and ivory from Africa, silks from China, and of course frankincense all passed through the kingdom of Saba before heading north on the caravan routes to the markets of Egypt, Mesopotamia, and the Mediterranean. You seem to sell everything. Special price today, just for you, my friend. But Sana wasn't the Sabaean capital. If I'm to find the queen, I need to head to a city called Marib, just 100 miles east over the mountains. But it might as well be a world away. It's in a very conservative, tribal area of the country that's known for its animosity towards outsiders. 
I'm told in no uncertain terms I should postpone my visit. In order to even make the trip, I need to find the right escort. Hussein sends me to the former governor of Marib and the present governor of Sana, Abdul Wahid al Buhiti. Abdul Wahid tells me that the Bedouin who live in Marib highly value their traditional customs. He suggests that before we head out, I should pick up a jambia, one of the large daggers that I've seen nearly all the men wearing here in Sana. If participating in the local traditions is the best way to gain acceptance and keep me safe, I'm all for it. Touch this one? It's okay? Yeah, yeah, you can. Then which is more important, the blade or the handle? The handle. The handle? Yeah. You can recognize anyone in the street through his Gambia. So You know he is from this area, he is from that area, this one from this tribe, this one that tribe, by the, his Gambia. Jambias have been an important status symbol in Yemen going back to Sabian times, and they communicate a lot about their owners. History and personality count. The older the Jambia handle, the more prized it is. Abdul Wahid tells me that one sheikh recently paid a million dollars for an especially prized Jambia. What do you think? It's pretty nice, huh? Jamil. In yeah. Arabic, Yamil means nice. Nice. Good? Okay. Very good. Like this or like? Very good. Okay. I guess it's okay. straight up, yeah? Yeah. You are Sadeyan. No. Shukran? All right. This now is that fun. I've got my Jambia, Abdul Wahed gives me a lesson in another time honored Yemeni tradition. Cut. We show it like this. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. You can use it, yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. How you taste it? Yeah, it's got a weird taste. Yeah. Kind it's, of tangy, it's, bitter. It's not, it's Very not dry. sweet. Very dry. What happens when you chew a lot of it? Like these guys are... Make you comfortable. Oh, like mellow. Uh, makes you, uh, wow. works a lot. Uh -huh. You can read a lot. Mm -hmm. And you can't sleep. Can't sleep? Yeah. Ah, Keep so, you up. Interesting. Yeah. And this is a tradition where... Kat is a natural stimulant, chewed by over 80% of the population each afternoon. It feels like about six shots of espresso. Okay. You can eat it. No, I'm, I'm good. It's I'm good. good. <laughs> what? Okay, what? okay. More. It's weird. Yeah, what? It's weird and good for you to eat it. It's not enough just to taste it. I have to have more. I've got to sign on for the full experience. It's weird and good for you to eat it all. Oh my God. So you can do it like this. Really? Uh-huh. So I, I okay. wouldn't want to offend him. No, okay. Nothing uh, will happen. It's okay. fine. It's fine. <laughs> I wish I could tell you what this tastes like, but it's like nothing else I've ever had. Okay. It's really bitter. Like maybe if you ate a whole bunch of dandelion greens, but wow, oh. bitter, bitter. Okay. So it? run. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna wait until I get some sort of effect, and I'll just float away. Okay. Now uh, we can be here. Now that I've had my crash course in Yemeni culture, I'm ready to head into the tribal desert. All right. So I'll settle up with this man here. Okay. I don't know if it's my excitement or the lingering effects of the cot, but the next morning, as the call to prayer signals dawn, I can't wait to hit the road. Good morning. It's a beautiful day. I've got my jambia, and now I've got to meet Abdul Wahed. We're going to Marib. Yalla. The road to Marib takes me from the mountainous highlands of Sana through some spectacular scenery to the flat, dusty edge of the vast desert known as the Empty Quarter. I'm going to meet Abdul Wahed along the route. He's traveled ahead to guarantee my safety in this lawless zone. Over the years, this road has developed a well-earned reputation for highway robbery. Good morning. Some of the tribes have been known to kidnap travelers and hold them for ransom. It's been good. Traveling with Abdul Wahed should make things go smoothly, but even he takes precautions. I gotta admit, 
This is my first time traveling in a car with three armed guards carrying machine guns. It's a little unsettling. You always travel with guards? Huh? You always travel with guards? With armed guards? Yeah. When you come to Marab, you need to have guns. Things have gotten better in recent years, but the 14 checkpoints we pass through along the way speak to the still volatile conditions. One hundred miles later, we arrive safely at the outskirts of the city. As we approach the ancient town, I see buildings rising in the distance. When we get closer, though, it becomes clear that what I see is a city of ruins. Abdul Wahed explains that these buildings date back some 300 years, but that the city's foundations go back nearly 3,000, to the time of the Queen of Sheba. After so many centuries of civilization, it was a modern war in the 1960s that finally left Old Marib a crumbling relic, inhabited by only a few lonely squatters. As we move on, I can only hope that the rest of Marib's ancient past hasn't met a similar fate and that something of the queen can still be found. I've traveled from the Horn of Africa to the deserts of Arabia in search of the Queen of Sheba. In the old city of Sana'a, I was welcomed by the local governor, Abdul Wahed al-Buhiti, who's escorting me through the lawless tribal deserts of Yemen. The Bedouin are famous for their hospitality, but hostility can also arise at a moment's notice, which we soon found out. After we left the ancient city of Marib, heavily armed tribesmen surrounded our camp in the middle of the night. We were literally under house arrest. In a place where foreigners are routinely kidnapped, the stakes were very high. Thankfully, Abdul Wahed has taken pains to help me navigate the terrain. Drawing on his contacts from his days as governor here, Abdul Wahed has called a meeting of the local tribal sheikhs so that I can pay my respects and prove my intentions. I make sure to do all the right things. I'm dressed appropriately with my new jambia and a traditional tribal skirt called a futa, and I pay close attention to all the local customs. Now I notice custom says we eat with our right hand only. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then the rice, you just kind of oh. grab the rice. Okay. Oh. Oh. Abdul Wahed explains my quest to the sheikhs, and the famous Bedouin hospitality quickly takes the place of the hostility. That's good. At least for now. Cool. cool. So this type of gathering hasn't changed much over the thousands of years, right? Not a lot. No. This water and the bottles. Yeah. It's changed. Okay. It's new. And some of the foods, maybe. The rice is new. Cell phones. Cell phones. Cell phones are new. Yeah, it's new. Okay. okay. After dinner, we sit around the fire to share stories about the Queen of Sheba that have been handed down through generations here in Marib. It's okay. Ah, very nice, he said. Yemeni. Yemeni, yes. Yemeni. My new jambia goes over well. In Ethiopia, the legends I heard about the Queen of Sheba were very detailed and played a big part in defining Ethiopian national identity. Now that I'm here in Yemen, I want to hear the Yemenis tell her story and find out about the place she occupies in their history and culture. They believe she came from the far desert and she is for sure from Marib. They feel a honor because Queen of Sheba from their land, from their hometown. I hear tales of a beautiful young woman named Bilkis, who appeared from the dunes to assume the throne of the kingdom of Saba. To the sheikhs, there's no doubt that this kingdom here in Marib and the biblical land of Sheba are one and the same. The Quran also tells vivid stories about the kingdom that Bilqis ruled, and what's more, where to find its remains. 
It was a heaven. Seven half two heavens. The sheikhs explain that the land of Saba is described in the Quran as land of the two paradises. The name comes from two oases created by a massive dam the Sabaeans built here in Marib, a dam whose ruins, they tell me, can still be seen nearby. It sounds like I need to go to see this dam and to explore Marib further. Do I have the permission of the sheikhs to do so? It's like a permission for you ah. to go anywhere. Okay. And so if I have their permission, that's all I need. Shukran. Oh. Yeah. And thank you for this. This was Shukran very special. Al Shukran ala al -waqt. Shukran ala al My evening with the sheikhs went over very well. Not only did I gain their permission to explore their land, but the stories they told me about the Queen of Sheba have inspired me. Now my goal is to search for archaeological evidence to support their stories. I've arranged to meet archaeologist Zaydun Zaid at the Marib Dam to tell me more. So this is one of the towers of the Dam of Marib. Yeah, this is the north tower, that's right. Where's uh, the other one? The south tower, just ahead of your eyes. That part, you see it? There, oh, wow, the south one. There. So there was a wall going The dam's the wall stretched from where we're standing all the way to the south tower, over 2,000 feet away. That made it about twice as wide as the Hoover Dam. The water it controlled was used to irrigate the valley below, supporting an estimated 35 to 50,000 people. This really must have been a lush green valley. Well, as you can see now, it's still green. And you yeah. can imagine at that time, it was much, much, much better. more. Yeah. The water was, which was coming out of here was supporting at the two sides of it, something like paradise. Two? At two sides of them, one at the right, one at the left. Oh, I've right. heard about this. So this is the left paradise and the right paradise. Exactly. That's, uh. that's it. The dam worked by collecting runoff from the mountains and then channeling the water into sluice gates on either side of the two towers. The gates, in turn, led to canals that branched into the valley below, creating the oases that gave Saba the name Land of the Two Paradises. As Zaydun and I make our way to the South Tower, I ask him what led to the collapse of this incredible structure and the civilization that built it. There is two theories about it. One which will say that the dam was destroyed by a strong earthquake. Zaydun says that an earthquake may have toppled the dam, or an unusually heavy rainy season could have damaged it beyond repair. In either case, the march of history also played a part. A shift in trade routes away from their territory had already dramatically weakened the kingdom, and they were unable to recover from the loss of the dam. What I've seen so far supports what I've heard about a flourishing civilization. But what about the queen? It's thought she would have reigned in the 10th century BC. So oh, here we are. Josh, wow. what else? What Does the archaeological evidence here date back far enough? Well, uh, the construction of the dam went through different phases, and what we are looking, in fact, at the latest of it. Well, Inscriptions the on the tower are written in the same Sabaean script I first saw in Ethiopia. Though they date this phase of the dam to the 7th century BC, after the time of the queen, Zaydun tells me that this is only the latest construction. Its origins go back far earlier. The Sabaeans continually updated and improved their dam over centuries. The Sabaean civilization managed to block this canyon in 1500 BC. So they finished building the dam at that point. But the history of damming using water goes back up to 3,200 BC. If this is true, the Sabaean civilization in Marib would have existed at the time the queen made her journey to Jerusalem. In fact, it would have been thriving. All that remains is to find her, and Zaydun has an answer for that, too. So it, would, it would make sense that somewhere in this region is a palace, and perhaps a queen. A queen with a temple. And is that true? Is there some place around here where that exists? Yeah, exactly. The temple of the Queen of Sheba. Right here. Right here. My search for the Queen of Sheba has taken me across the world and thousands of years back in time. 
In a religious archive, I heard the stories of her journey to Jerusalem to visit King Solomon. In Ethiopia, I learned that frankincense could have provided her with the wealth she was famous for. Here in Yemen, I discovered that she and her civilization appear in the Quran and in the oral traditions of the local people. I've now come to the possible seat of her civilization, a sand-swept temple that bears her name, Mahram Bilkis, the sanctuary of the Queen of Sheba. To learn what it reveals of the queen, I'm meeting up with another extraordinary woman. Marilyn Phillips Hodgson of the American Foundation for the Study of Man has been excavating here for nearly a decade. Before we explore the temple, Marilyn and I must pay our respects to the sheikh who watches over the site. Sheikh Marzouk and his sons keep a close eye on the Mahram Bilkis, the centerpiece of their heritage, and they want to be sure of my intentions. I'm grateful that the sheikh is welcoming me because he's packing a lot of heat. My explorations here in Marib have attracted some attention. And while I have the blessing of the tribes to be here, I still have to tread carefully. After some friendly diplomacy, we're given the go-ahead to explore the temple grounds. So, so this wall, this was the first thing discovered here? Well, sure, because everything else was covered by sand. Marilyn tells me that the entire complex encompasses 37 acres, making it the largest ancient temple in the entire Arabian Peninsula. But only a small percentage of it has actually been excavated. Working here is a never-ending battle against the blowing sands, which rebury much of the site between digging seasons. I ask Marilyn how she came to work in such a forbidding place. I came here because I wanted to fulfill my brother's unfinished dreams, but now it's my passion. The Mahram Bilkis was first excavated by Marilyn's brother, Wendell Phillips, in the early 1950s. When he began, the site was almost entirely covered in sand. And though his dig lasted only one season, he uncovered a wealth of artifacts. So your brother brings his archaeological team here. They start excavating. What happens? They found many, many exciting, wonderful treasures. One of the greatest is, I happen to have a picture here to show you. Oh, yeah. It's every, every Yemeni has a picture of it because it's on the 50 real note. Wow. Wow, so this was such an exciting find that they actually put it on their money. That's right. More than four feet high warrior. One of the rulers of this great area. That's impressive. It is. The statue that Wendell Phillips found is considered to be one of the masterpieces of Sabaean art. It depicts a ruler called the Mahdi Karib, complete with a jambia at his waist. This statue from the 6th century BC helped put a face to the queen's glorious civilization. Unfortunately, Wendell was never able to finish his work. Tribal strife forced him to flee Marib after just four months on the site. He didn't want to leave. It was a terrible heartbreak. They left all their cars, all the artifacts, everything remained behind. So after making these world-class discoveries, he has to flee for his life? Yes. So what happens to this site? It filled up with sand, and only the great pillars showed there. Uh -huh and uh, the Awam enclosure, the Great Wall. This space that we're sitting in now, 18 feet above us, was, was all sand. All sand. Wow. Nearly 50 years passed before Marilyn and her team were able to return to Marib. Since work has resumed, the foundation has unearthed much more of the site. This is like the Library of Congress then? Yes. We're joined by the assistant site director, Yemeni archaeologist, Abdu Ghalib who shows me some of their recent discoveries. So anything that had to do with daily life or was important to them, they put on these stones. They built it here. The Mahram Bilkis is literally covered in inscriptions from top to bottom. The elegant South Arabian script that I've seen throughout my journey adorns nearly every surface of the temple. This inscription talking about social, economic, and about the, the tribes, the names, and what they believe, you know. Abdu tells me that all aspects of daily life were recorded here from ritual dedications to social and economic histories. And the foundation's team has only scratched the surface. So, below this. Below, below this. Yeah. Below this goes back to the 8th century BC, but it's covered now by sand again. So if you were to dig down. If you dig down, 
You will go down, 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 50 meters. Like the Great Dam of Marib, the Mahram Bilqis was improved and expanded over successive generations. To date, they have yet to find any inscriptions referring to the Queen of Sheba. But the deeper they dig, the further back in time they go, and thus closer to the time of the Queen. I asked Abdu in Maryland if what they found can shed any light on the legends I've heard throughout my journey. This is the main gate of the temple. They take me to a newly temple discovered temple. area of the temple, where they show me a grand staircase decorated with antelope heads. I've seen these before in Ethiopia, and both cultures claim to have this belief that the Queen of Sheba is from their homeland. Yeah, because the Queen of Sheba is the Queen of Saba. You know, uh, she's a, a Sabaean uh, queen, and the people who lived in, in Ethiopia and established the kingdom of Ethiopia are Sabaean people. Wow. So this helps explain the Ethiopians' beliefs that they're descended from the Queen of Sheba. In a way, they are, or at least from her civilization. Why you see the similar decoration and language, writing. yeah, and writing. So that this was the center. I mean, actually, we're standing at the center of the Sabaean civilization. Yes. And if the Queen of Sheba, which sounds like it, if the Queen of Sheba lived here, and her influence would have spread throughout her domain, and that, you said, went into Ethiopia. Exactly. And that's why they believe that, they, that she was their queen as well. Yeah, that's, wow. that's right. It is, it, you know, Marilyn and Abdu have, have one last thing they yeah. want me to see. Yeah. At the top of the staircase, they bring me to a wall covered in sand and invite me to help them dig. Okay. Abdu explains that they rebury this treasured artifact after each season to protect it from the elements. Look at that. Yeah. It's a face. As we clear away the sand, I can see why they take so much care. Who found this? Me and Menelin when we were digging here in 2001. That must have been pretty exciting. Yeah, oh, it was. <laughs> it was very exciting Look at here. that. So. Every time you see it, what do you think? It, it became more beautiful. More beautiful? Yes. No. This is my favorite discovery, even though it's not as early as the time of the Queen of Sheba. I'm sure that when we do see the tattoo of the Queen of Sheba, she will be something like this. It's clear that the Mahram Bilqis is an incredible archaeological site. Every season of digging reveals more about the remarkable Sabaean civilization and brings Marilyn and Abdu closer to finding the real Queen of Sheba. She speaks to you. She says, keep digging. Yeah, we'll keep digging. And to think that just by digging another 10 meters, you could come face to face with the most famous queen in the world. Yeah, somewhere we are going to find the queen of Sheba. So you don't believe it's a question of if, but just a question of when? It's a question of time and a question of work. So we're going to find her here. My mission to uncover the real story of the queen of Sheba has been a success. I haven't found her yet, but I have found her civilization and learned firsthand how she became so important to cultures in both South Arabia and the Horn of Africa. Perhaps Marilyn and Abdu will find her here, and perhaps very soon. What is certain is that the story of this legendary queen will continue to captivate.